Hello. All right. Greetings. How you doing, Elliot? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm good. Good. I just had such a moment where I was planning to stream this to YouTube. Uh -huh. And then after all this planning, YouTube just decided to, you know, just not be able to do that. And I magically switched everything over to Facebook Live. So we'll be streaming on that. And uh, it's pretty exciting. And then I had to tell the people from YouTube to go to Facebook Live. And all the while, I was just trying to, you know, just see how ACT would apply for this situation. <laughs> you know, what my mind was telling me, how like I'll be like the laughing stock, you know, I'll have my license revoked. Right, so that dictator within definitely had plenty to say about that situation. And I'm so glad that you made the time to join us today. Sure. And um, yeah, so this is part of the uh, My OCD Care lecture series where um, you know, we have different people uh, speaking about different ideas um, about OCD, about anxiety, um, CBT in general, all the various waves and um you know we want to just get more information out there uh new ideas within the field so i'm really glad that you're able to join us i'll just read a brief intro from your website uh dr stephen hayes is nevada foundation professor in the behavioral analysis program uh, at the department of psychology at the university of nevada um, an author of 44 books and one that just came out, which was, which is truly amazing. Um, a Liberated Mind, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and nearly 600 scientific articles. His career um, has focused on analysis of the nature of human language and cognition and the application of this to understanding and alleviation of human suffering. Um, and I guess just briefly, like my first uh, foray into therapy was actually in an ACT lab with, uh, with Dr. Joseph Scardipane. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, he was my first mentor and a shout out to him if he's watching, hello. Um, so, so basically I came to grad school to, you know, as a psychologist to like make people feel better. And I got to this lab where they were talking about something very different. And there was this thing called ACT where you know, we're not trying to make people who are sad feel happy or anxious, you know, feel, feel calm, but it's something very different. And I wanted to know, um, I guess to start, if you could just give a brief introduction to what ACT is. And yeah, we'll sure. start there. Well, thanks for having me uh, on the program. Uh, you might be able to tell I, you, or if you haven't yet, you will. I have a bit of a cold, but... Uh, uh, hopefully I won't uh, cough at uh, folks too much, but uh, uh, ACT has been developed uh, over nearly 40 years, and so it has quite a long history, but it's become more known in the last 20 years. And it, there's a large community around the world which is helping uh, to develop it, and including people like Joe, who uh, I've known for many years. And what ACT is, is a uh, if you just talked about it in terms of what it looks like or what are the procedures used, well, it's kind of part of CBT, but it has a different set of assumptions than traditional cognitive behavioral approaches. And it mixes acceptance and mindfulness processes and commitment and behavior change processes for the purpose of producing what we call psychological flexibility. What psychological flexibility is, is a kind of an immediate target that makes a difference in long-term outcomes. If you mismanage it, it predicts all kinds of bad outcomes. And if you manage it well, it predicts the life that's gonna unfold in a powerful way. And it's a collection of six things that has to do with emotional openness, being able to sort of notice your thinking without becoming entangled with it. To do this from this kind of awareness a point of view, not the ego-based or the face that you put on for others, but this kind of deeper sense of self, this more spiritual sense of self, you might say, uh, and then being able to come into the present moment inside and out in a way that is flexible, fluid, and voluntary, and then focus your attention on what 
brings meaning and purpose into your actions and build habits around that. So those are, there's six things in there. If I slow it down, I can pull them out and name them. They fit together. They go together. They support each other. It turns out that no one of them can kind of stand alone. You can't really do any one of them to the nines without sort of moving towards all of them. If you could simplify the six, I would say it's a matter of being psychologically open, aware, conscious, and in the moment and engaged in what brings meaning and purpose into your life. So open, aware, and engaged will give you most of the model. And there's nuances uh, in those three. Well, it turns out if you use acceptance and mindfulness processes, commitment and behavior change processes to, to focus on that, it gives you kind of an immediate target and you can know that you're changing it. And then, over time, what that does is things like anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationships, being able to manage uh, health issues, step up to the challenges of physical disease when that comes down the pike, or you're looking at an old dude. Uh, what happens when aging starts showing up and people start um, falling away or you know, abilities you used to have you no longer have, or other things like uh, being able to manage a business or to... Um, uh, you know, deal with your own uh, biases in a way that fits your values. You know, what do you do with parts of you that are prejudiced or stigmatizing towards others? All of those things, turns out, as an empirical fact, sitting on top of now a mountain of evidence, are fostered or helped or supported by psychological flexibility. So that's the game we're playing. And it um, gives us a new way forward inside the evidence-based therapies. Strongly evidence-based, there's more than 300 randomized trials in almost everything you can name, from yeah. sports to, uh, to depression to anxiety to being able to go through a, 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 a exercise program and on and on and on it goes. Yeah, and Act's commitment to really rigorous science has, has always been something that really attracted to me. It's not like, trust me, or this feels so good or it feels so right, it's, it's about data. And I really like that it's very data-driven in its approach. Um, so as far as its application to the treatment of OCD, um, yeah. what kind of a research um, is there behind using it for OCD? What might be in the works? Yeah. Well, there's quite a bit. Um, you know, the, in terms of randomized trials and so forth, we're probably looking at a, uh, at least a dozen. If you look at the underlying core processes, a much larger number. And some major people in OCD uh, are uh, focused on it. You know, people like the, the folks who run the OCD Foundation or, you know, things that are of importance to people who suffer with OCD. And it, it seems to give a new way forward in part because of its unusual way that it handles issues of language and cognition. And so, uh, especially in areas like, you know, more purely obsessive kinds of things and so forth. It, it adds to the exposure-based methods that we have. The emotional openness piece adds to it by helping you to put exposure in a larger context. And the values uh, work helps by, you know, giving you another motivation beyond, um, you know, a secret desire to have the anxiety go, to, go away. You know, anxiety goes up and down and anxiety may go away, but it turns out there's a little loopy paradox there, which is if it's really, really, really important for you not to be anxious, then anxiety is something to be anxious about. And so there's a self-amplifying loop that comes basically from this more evolutionarily recent adaptation that you and I are doing right now. We're not doing what the bird outside the window is doing. They're doing the same thing they were doing uh, you know, 20,000 years ago, but we're doing stuff that are pretty new on the planet. And uh, language and cognition can mash up against things that are ancient. If you give you an example, if you had something difficult happen when you're a kid, let's say, and then something similar occurs and you begin to feel anxious, that process is almost half a billion years old. Every single organism that evolved since the Cambrian, which is 545 million years ago, does that. All of them. 
snakes and horses and dogs and cats they all do now jellyfish don't sponges don't but you're not a jellyfish but what you and i are doing right now is not that you know maybe it's a couple hundred thousand years ago maybe it's a couple million years ago guessing as to what the hominids did but it's not what the rest of the animal kingdom is doing and we've taken the time you, you gave us a little shout out for being evidence-based we're evidence-based in another way an even older way that's inside the behavior therapy tradition from which the cbt tradition came which is dig down to these basic principles and in the case of language and cognition we we did that hard slog and we don't think we have the ultimate answer or final answer but we think we don't, don't have a darn good answer as to what is really going on and what you and I are doing right now and why does it make anxiety, depression and so forth so hard for us and what can we do about it? So, uh, so there's quite a bit. And I, if I could just say, you know, I really have heart for this part of the work. A, I've struggled with it a little bit. B, my mother was clinically OCD. I mean, all the way down to bleeding hands and mm -hmm. uh, things of that kind. Uh, yeah, I think I've found out things about her history only in the last few years. She's dead now, but died five years ago at the age of 93. She'd be 98 as of two weeks ago if she was still living. A very sweet, wonderful lady, but suffered enormously uh, with both depression and OCD. And so I've seen what it can do. I've watched kind of how it works inside me. And it's a wonderful window into the problem we all face, which is how can we create a context in which we get to be here conscious and whole and free and still have this analytic, judgmental, worrying, produces rumination focused, problem solving mind that, uh, as you said earlier, dictates to us. That's a challenge. And uh, OCD opens the door to some really interesting and I think useful uh, uh, ideas about how to be whole and free, despite the mm -hmm. fact that you got this problem solving organ between your ears. Yeah, and I definitely find that um, ACT has made its way into the way pretty much everyone treats OCD now. I, I find like there is almost some influence in the way, whether it's just focusing more on values Yep. Or, or diffusion techniques. So there are a lot of therapists who will describe themselves as, you know, they're ERP therapists, but they're act informed yes. versus those who are like using uh, Dr. Tuig's manual. Um, wh what are your thoughts on, on you know, you know uh, act informed or, or using some act principles with, uh, you know, exposure response prevention classic? I, I think it works fine. I, I really don't have a problem with that. I'm not kind of an act uber all this guy. You'd think that I would be. <laughs> but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if we bring processes in, into our work that matter for people, you know, the name and the details of stuff doesn't matter over time. Now, there are some places that you can get contradictions. So I would be cautious about, on the one hand, saying, Really what you need to do is detect, challenge, dispute, and change your irrational thoughts versus really what you need to do is take a step back and notice your thoughts and letting your thoughts be thoughts and then bring your attention to what's of importance in the situation. And using skills, you use the word diffusion. We call it that. It's a neologism. We made it up. You won't find it in the dictionary. Uh, I had a role in making it up because I couldn't, say the name that I first used, which was deliteralization. Okay. Just can say it fast, say that 10 times, you can't do it. But diffusion, you, diffusion, 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 you can do it. So we made it up. It's not diffusion, it's D and the word fusion. And you know, in OCD, there's long been an understanding that there's a kind of a fusion between a thought that occurs and what it refers to. It seems as though just to think it is to have it, is to experience it, is even to do it. I mean, it's right inside some of the, uh, you know, the kind of undoing rituals that people may have or things of that kind is that a very strong, I would say almost fear or connection that language is what it says it is. 
And, you know, and children go through a, a phase like that, you know, don't step on a crack or break your grandmother's back or, you know, thinking ill of somebody. And never mind children. I, I, when I'm doing talks about this, I say, okay, you think you're so free of all this? I'll tell you what, uh, once you think of somebody you love, stand up and say out loud, really loud, I hope they die tomorrow. People won't do it. Well, what do you think? The words are magic. You think like sound is good, but they won't do it. So that's how strong even in all of us, you know, words have this magical quality that thinking is doing. And it is a kind of doing, but it's not what your mind says. So back to point, I would be cautious about working with a therapist that would give you this challenge both fight to get rid of the irrational thought and change it and step back and notice it dispassionately with an attitude of curiosity. I mean, how do you do both those things at the same time? I don't know how to do it. But if you just take away that part, um, you know, I'm, I'm okay with act informed uh, work. And I think exposure is so important because the, you know, the bottom line, is that life is going to happen and it's going to ask you, are you willing to experience this? You know, whatever the particular thing is. And if that's not true, well then why is the thing even disruptive in your life? You know, you know, we could uh, create a uh, situation that might look superficially like OCD, but if it never occurred, you know, if you never actually faced that situation, never happened to you, you know, you're afraid of something, let's say, that never occurs. Well, you know, if, if you're an obsessive spin around it, then it is occurring. It's occurring right now. But so, you know, we're not the brain police. We don't have to sort of clean up everybody's thought process or something. But if you're in a situation where things are difficult for you, then, yeah, I want to bring what the science suggests is uh, most helpful. And I, I know I'm going on, excuse me for that, but one little point. Yeah, it's, it's great. One little point is there's something cool about diffusion because you don't nominate certain people as winners and losers. We are all getting hooked all the time. And it's as important to unhook yourself a little bit from positive thoughts as negative ones. If you're thinking, I'm great, I'm grand, there's no one better than me, Man, I don't care if that looks positive. Hang around with people who are living inside that story and you, you kind of don't want to be around. Yeah. It has a cost. Mm -hmm. So just because it's positive doesn't mean it doesn't have a cost. The form doesn't decide it. It's the function that decides it. And because of that, there's a real kind of leveling of the playing field. And yeah, you see something with uh, clinical OCD that you might not see. Uh, in the absence of that. But in terms of the really basic processes, man, this is shared. People are not alone. They're not, you know, the, you know, the ones who are weird and other people aren't or something. It's not like that. This is just a process that we all touch. Getting a hold of a human being in such a way that's creating some real problems. But in small ways, it's creating problems for all of us. So we can be more kind of, um, more level and more fair. And, uh, you know, I think that's true, not just with OCD, but a lot of the disorders. I mean that I want to put them in scare quotes because the real processes involved in these quote unquote disorders are human processes that are shared by almost everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I want to discuss a little bit about rumination, um, you know, compulsive rumination in particular, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, like, pure, pure O, and very often, like, their compulsions are, are very much mental, and they'll experience, like, continuous rumination. Um, what, what is the act understanding of a compulsive rumination in OCD and the most effective way to address it? Yeah, there's several... Uh, flexibility and inflexibility processes that bear on it. For one thing, our attentional processes going back to the past and trying to figure out, you know, why this happened or what the sequence is, is very close to problem solving. It's even necessary in problem solving. 
if suddenly in the middle of this uh, little podcast, you found yourself in the grocery store, the very first thing you'd come to mind is how the heck did I get here? And so you want to be oriented. You want to know how you got here. Why? Because it may help you, for example, get back in front of the mic so that you can finish this uh, Facebook live stream. Yeah. Oh, so there's this little piece. That's the piece of orientation. Right? The, the verbal part of figuring it out, understanding it, putting it in a system, being able to predict, that's central to problem solving too. If you... Uh, had a, your car break down, you got to figure out why did it break down? What do I need to do to break it? And you're, you're going to read and you're going to reason and you're going to think it through. There's an emotional punch that comes with it too. I mean, part of what activates it is this feeling of, of doom or unease or something bad's about to happen or maybe I'm bad or, you know, if I don't, something really bad's going to happen. There's that kind of pull to the past in order to control the future, but there's an emotional punch to it. And that includes bodily sensations, memories, uh, and emotions. Well, you know, we want to be able to feel, all of us want to be able to feel, but the mind tells you, yeah, okay, you can do that, but only if you feel good stuff. And it doesn't feel good, uh, you know, in those spaces where you compulsively ruminate. If you're to slow it down and watch what your body feels like, what your emotions are, what memories show up, you'll notice there's a lot of, stuff happening there that is very unpleasant yeah so those are the th three kind of examples but there's others you know sometimes the what you're ruminating about spills over even into how you think about yourself who would i be if i or if this doesn't get handled what does it show that i'm you know it has a larger spread it sort of fits with a story you know, like maybe I'm perverted, maybe I'm mean, maybe I'm insane, maybe I am uh, can't be trusted, maybe I'm the devil, maybe I'm an on and on or whatever it is, you know, I mean, things show up that are more like self-concept things, right? And, you know, that is sticky. I think it's a sticky in part because we fear that if we don't have the right persona, and really, I'm saying it in the way the Greeks would, you know, meant the clay mask that the theater performers wore in Greek theater. That persona was a fixed expression. And if I have the wrong persona, I'm not going to be wanted. I'm not going to be welcome. I'm not going to be brought in. Nobody's going to want to be with me. I'm not going to be part of the group. And the fear sometimes inside ruminative processes is if you know i don't somehow change this or fix this or eliminate this i'm going to be cast out you know i'm going to be the one who's rejected who's alone you know well the kind of monkey we are that's life and death you know we we are biologically prepared to really care about others i mean babies if you get in front of them i mean neonates they're only a few hours old and you look them in the eyes they dump natural uh, opiates in their brain and they go like woohoo i'm being seen you know <laughs> so we come and it needs to be because we need to be able to orient the other creatures around us in order just to survive infancy you know I mean, it's there for a reason we're dependent on others and those little coos and smiles and all that you do as an infant is life and death for an infant. If the, if the other monkeys called humans didn't like babies, you know, you'd, you're not going to survive that era. So there's lots of reasons for why it's impactful. But what ACT gives you is some counterintuitive ways forward with it. And of the three I've just mentioned, but there's others that are uh, haven't gotten to yet. But the three I just mentioned would be would it be possible to be oriented in the now and to respectfully decline your mind's invitation to get oriented in the grand arc of the past and the future? I mean, just notice that you're here, you're here now, you're in this situation, and this thing you're ruminating about, ruminating about may not even be relevant in the here and now. And part of what's in the here and now is are these thoughts. You can notice that too, but without entering into them and disappearing into the conceptualized past. So that's one. Could we find a place in which we can belong by birthright and not belong by having the right mask that we put on? 
So the punch of that fear that you're going to be cast out is eliminated. And instead, what we're, what we're connecting with is the, the, the uh, gratitude and power of being connected with others as we are. You know, including these things that we worry that are unacceptable, the thoughts that we have, or the history that we have, or the feelings that we have, or the urges that we have. Could we be more open to our own emotions instead of having this agenda? We only get to feel good emotions, which means we basically can't feel safe in feeling any emotions because even the good ones go away. And you don't know how to subtract emotions anyway. And could we instead focus on how to feel in ways that are more open and free? And then with thoughts, could we respectfully decline the mind's invitation to take the thoughts literally and instead take what's useful and, and, and leave the rest? So when the mind's telling you, you have to, and then that voice gets real loud, you have to go back. Did you actually do this? Did you do it the number of times? What have you know, whatever the particular content is, you know, do you, maybe you really do have a disease. Maybe you would contaminate that person, whatever the particular thing is. Could instead you notice that thought as a thought and allow it to be followed or not based on your actual experience of what works for you. I have a very gentle, not heavily mindy, not figure it out, but just be guided by your experience. And I think most people, when they struggle with OCD, they know full well that another run around that mulberry bush is not going to do anything helpful, but it's so powerful. And if we can find the ways to sort of take the thoughts that are really up close and put them out a little bit so you can still see them, but in that gap, you have a little bit of choice that you can notice them without necessarily having to do what they say or erase them. So those are examples of the kinds of things that you do in an ACT approach that would augment and facilitate the exposure work that you do in almost all the evidence-based therapies of dealing with OCD. Sorry for going on. So no, it's, it's golden. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that. And um, so I try to listen and at the same time, think of my next question. So that time I was trying to mindfully listen and now I'm going to come back to my, okay, RFT, right? Uh, relation, relational frame theory. Sometimes I find like that differentiates those who are act informed and those who are act practitioners per se. Yes. Um, so, so I, I'm part of a OCD specialist group on Facebook. It's a really great, great group. Shout out if anyone's, uh, watching from them um and the have you heard of um association splitting or or that uh concept where i haven't i haven't i'm interested in it give me yeah. get me up to speed get me up to speed on it oh what? yeah so i'm definitely not the one who could get you up to speed on it as i've only recently heard it but basically like we have you know in our minds um kind of, you know, individuals with OCD often instead of just, you know, for example, in contamination, OCD won't, you know, see, um, instead of seeing like doorknob opening the door, doorknob uh, access, doorknob, um, you know, moving forward, they'll see like, they'll instead associate doorknob germ, door, sure. doorknob HIV. So association splitting, I recently learned is a technique where you practice like realigning the original associations, uh, oh, yeah. not in the heat, not like when you're in um, a really challenging moment, not when you're in like a, a panic moment. It's sure, like sure. specifically like training, um, training yourself to like broaden your associations with uh, fear cool. stimu stimulus. Um, so in, in the group, they brought up uh, relation, uh, how this very much sounds like RFT, yeah. right? And, and how, yeah, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to RFT and OCD, as well as, um, you know, your, based on my quick synopsis of the sure. association splitting. 
Let me, yeah. yeah, I think it would uh, fit, and maybe you could uh, even uh, use RFT to expand out the method a little bit, which I'll, having just heard it, I'm on a riff, but I'll, I'll get to it in a second. You know, the difference between RFT and other approaches to language is that it's one of the few real evidence-based ones in psychology that is based on the concept of relationship and not simply on the concept of association. Association is one kind of relationship, and there's, but it's not, it's not the only kind. And the re, when you when you realize that uh, language is relational, it lands in two ways. One is that you're less uh, certain that you can use uh, traditional eliminative methods with language and have good outcomes. And number two is that you realize there's many avenues towards the same point. Let me give you an example of what I mean by the difference between association and relation, but I'll do it with a metaphor. And I'll do it actually with a, a contamination issue, but it, it, it's just because it's an easy one. Uh, but it's, uh, I'm not deliberately trying to walk it over into the OCD area. It's just a, an interesting one. If you're in a large group, like let's say in a movie theater, and somebody walked in and uh, shook somebody's hand and then that intermission left. And then let's say before the movie lets out, the CDC shows up and says, there's a person who walked in and shook someone's hand and then left and they have a terrible disease and we need to figure out everybody who either shook his hand or talked to anybody who did during the intermission. Well, that would be like an associative model. Association is kind of like if there's chalk on your hand and you shook somebody else's hand, there'll be chalk on their hand. It'd be like, you know, propagating disease, uh, germs by touch. That's mm -hmm. association. And in psychology, you know, association works because things come together in time and place or they look similar. That's it. They either directly touched each other in time and space or quite close, like in classical conditioning, you know, bell food, bell food, bell food, pretty soon the bell makes you salivate. Or they look similar, uh, you know, like the, the red light comes on and then shock happens and then the purple light comes on and it's not as strong a response, but more than if a yellow light came on because it looks more like a red light. All right. What if we think about so, so imagine that movie theater. If you think about it that way, and if, if these were thoughts instead, you might be able to say, well, you know, maybe I could really do something eliminative. I could just find the few thoughts that touch this thought and somehow change or get rid of them. That seems possible. But now let me give you another metaphor. Suppose it's not like that. Suppose the mind is like a movie theater, same movie theater, full of people. Except here's the deal. They're all related. We say our relations, meaning our family. So maybe this is one ginormous family that had its, uh, you know, annual uh, gathering, you know, like the, the relatives of Thomas Jefferson. You ever seen how big that is? I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people show up that are somehow related to Thomas Jefferson. And now we know some of them are African-Americans. So it's kind of cool. It's a mixed audience shows up and they're all related, right? Suppose I knew how everybody was related in this big movie theater. And a person walks in and shakes somebody's hand, except I don't know who that person is. And then they sit down and then at intermission they leave. And then before the end, the person comes in and says, you know that person who came in and sat back there and, and shook somebody's hand, that's Susie over there's uh, sister of her sister. See Susie over there? Could you stand up, Susie? Yeah. That's her sister, Joan's sister, uh, uh, kid, okay? If everybody was related and you knew everybody's, knew that, you could relate everybody to everybody in that movie theater. It would take you like 10 years to list them all. I mean, you do the math on it, it's just incredible when you have a big crowd. Right. I mean, just the number of zeros to express how many relationships. But here's my point. How many new relationships now are possible by knowing who the person is who came in the door? It's an enormous number. Enormous. What if the mind's like that? 
And by the way, it is. Mm -hmm. It is. Everything relates to everything in every possible way. I use the example of family relationships. But let me, let me give you an exercise that shows this. And what it will show to people who are struggling with OCD, number one, why eliminating thoughts is never going to work. Number two, what else could you do with things like you're talking about with association splitting? So, so here's the exercise. Uh, let's come up with two nouns and a relationship. So I'm going to do it for you, and I'm going to do it by looking at what's on my desk. And Sounds over like here, a projective test. <laughs> yes. Okay. So over here, I, I, I see a small glass. It's right there. And right over here, I see a little lip gloss. Okay. And I'm going to pick a weird relationship, uh, but I'll use one like the one I just used. Let's call it is the father of. So here's the thing we have to do. How is a small glass the father of lip gloss? We have to come up with an answer or something bad will really happen. So let's just see if we can do it. So I'm tagging you with this uh, problem, Ellie. Can you come up with one? All right. Oh. So how is a small glass the father of lip gloss? Of lip well, gloss. Well, the first lip gloss was actually came from, you know, a small glass was the original receptacle until it evolved to more of the plastic types. Awesome. So maybe we, like they put in the wax, they mixed it up. They might have actually put it in a glass. That's actually quite possible, right? Yeah. Before they made those little sticks that you buy mm -hmm. when they're working on the formula. I bet you they had some sort of, okay. Now here's the point. Either that was just an accident or every, because you notice when you came up with the answer, it seems like it's really in the object, right? It isn't arbitrary. It really could be this, this small glass is the father of lip gloss. Okay, we'll do it the other way around. How's the lip gloss the father of small glass? Um, well, the original, um, when the small glass was being designed, it was done actually with the lip gloss. And Awesome. Somebody yeah. actually lost their pen and they used lip gloss. Yeah, it was actually a fascinating They laid moment. out the plan on a piece of paper. Yeah. It could have actually happened, couldn't it have? Yeah. Okay, now notice. It looks as though it's actually in the objects now. It's not arbitrary. But I have done this exercise 130, 40, 200 times with just ridiculous, because usually I say somebody in the audience think of a noun, somebody in the audience think of a noun, and I'll give them some relationships to pick from, and they pick one. I make it more arbitrary. There's actually a little, in the RFT book, the original one, there's a table where you can do it by numbers. You just pick three numbers and then you look on the table and they'll give you a sentence like that. You know, like how is right. a kangaroo, uh, you know, better than a piece of chalk? You know I mean? It's just, mm -hmm. well, it's always answerable. And when you finish and it's apt, it almost always feels like, wow, it's actually right there in the object. It's not arbitrary. That has to be an illusion. Either everything is related to everything else in all possible ways, or this is an illusion of mind. We can relate anything to anything in any possible way. Exactly. <laughs> well, now here's the problem. You're going to clean that up. You're going to subtract something from that. Are you kidding me? As soon as you go in and say, oh man, I don't want the lip gloss to remind me of, of the glass. Uh, okay, the lip gloss has nothing to do with the glass. Nothing to do, nothing to do, okay? Uh, I'll get rid of it. It's terrible. It's terrible to think that he drew with lip gloss. I hate that thought. Ooh, it gives me the creeps for whatever reason, right? Okay, but wait a minute. Now that you've finished and the lip gloss has absolutely nothing to do with the glass, I'm going to ask you a question. And I'm going to do it with a little paralinguistic cues. Say what comes to mind. Hot. Sun. Okay. Do it to, listen to my paralinguistic cues. Good. Morning. Uh, okay. I, I'm going to give you a couple seeds then. Hot, cold. Just like in, in playing Password, I was relying on your hot. And I'm going to do good. And the answer is bad. Have you got that? Okay. okay so gotcha. that's my little clue. All right. So now, white. Black. Okay, great. Big. Small. Okay. Lip gloss. 
glass. You see the problem? Yeah. If you succeeded in making it nada or different from or even opposite to, the problem is it's still related because the mind doesn't do just equals. It will do not equals. It will do different. It will opposite. It will completely, you know, you can remind people of white with the word black, right? So how is it eliminating this scary thing to be going, oh, uh, 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 lip gloss doesn't have anything to do with the glass or, you know, the door. Not, uh, so back to your association splitting. You know, what I think you want to do is maybe practice the relational connections between a doorknob, for example, and opening, moving through, etc. But be very, very careful about practicing nada with regard to germs nada. Because germs nada doorknob or doorknob nada germ will actually paradoxically build the relationship between germs and doorknobs in the new form of nada opposite of or whatever. So I bet you in the associative splitting, they're practicing creating a positive, not positive, meaningful associations. I bet you they're cautious about not doing what I think many of us would do with that, which is to practice eliminating and subtracting associations. Because when you practice that, you're building them. Because any relation is a relation. And it's, it's why, uh, you know, I, I can tell you this as a panic disordered person in recovery, uh, even though I have struggled with OCD, I've told, I wrote, told some stories uh, about that in The Liberated Mind, but uh, there's a phenomenon in panic disorder called relaxation-induced panic. Right, right. And it goes like this. Boy, I, these tapes are really working. I'm feeling so relaxed. That's so great. That's so awesome. It's a lot better than it was last week when it was really awful and nervous, but now I'm feeling more relaxed, and I really like this better, a lot better than that 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 nerve a lot did my heart just skip a beat there I, yeah because i'm feeling how how far away is the door i'm feeling a lot i'm not feeling so good i'm I, boom you can have a panic attack by noticing that you're relaxed and somebody yeah. listening to this is probably going to think of a glass when they hear about lip gloss <laughs> so <laughs> It's a wild horse. I, you know, you, these things are happening when you're asleep, dude. You know, have you ever had dreams and you wake up and then you, for like hours you feel differently and something's a little off or, or something sweet sometimes? Well, yeah. but you're not controlling that. But it's literally making connections. It's like a spider weaving a web or like a fractal, you know, just running the formula even when you're not watching. So, um, RFT cautions, be careful about subtraction. And then it gives you a lot of cool ways of playing with uh, amplifying and using networks. But then the final thing it says is, it only makes a difference in behavior when you give it a function. And there's a lot of things you can do that diminish functions. So we've learned, we've created hundreds of diffusion methods I'll give you an example. Uh, take a thought that normally was really punchy, that you know causes you to wince, to look away, to want to change things, you know, to undo something like that. Okay, uh, my kid falling in the playground. Okay, that's, that's an intrusive thought that comes in. Okay, now take that same thought and sing it to the tune of "Happy Birthday." Okay. Yeah, this is a that's that's a great. I've I've done this one a lot, but yeah, my kid falling off the slide. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, you know, you, if you did awesome the same movie. thing in the voice of your least favored politician, do the same thing in the voice of Donald Duck. Not so under playground, or um. Uh, you know, just uh, say it very, very slowly. Or uh, say it in a different accent. Or, you know, the point is not to eliminate. The point is to notice that it's a thought. 
Yeah. I'm having a thought that lip gloss goes with small glasses or is different from. Fine. Thank you very much. You know, like I suggest that people give their their uh, dictator within a name. I, mine is called George. So George tells me things and it tells me to worry about things. And I usually thank George for his effort to run my life. And sometimes when I'm doing my taxes or trying to remember whether or not, uh, you know, I've made the dentist appointment or something, it's helpful. A lot of times it's not helpful. So could we use what's useful and respectfully decline the rest? You don't have to go to war with it. Treat it more like you would if you had a kid following you talking constantly. Some of what's said might be useful. A lot of it won't. Yeah, and that's, I guess, how it all comes down to flexibility, right? Exactly. And so these diffusion skills that we teach and act are not to, to explode meaning. We need meaning when you're doing your taxes or fixing your car or reasoning out for problem solving, but put it on a leash because if you're not careful, that same dictator will say, I'm you and you have to do this or else, or you will never be able to function if you don't do this and this and this. The next thing you know, you've lost control of your life in the attempt to get control over your thoughts and feelings by following what the dictator says, which doesn't give you control over them anyway. And plus, meanwhile, the costs happen. You know, if yeah. you're count counting putting on your socks a uh, hundred times, you know, you're missing the, the bus or you're not there for the meeting or you're, you know, it's human, but it's not, it's not what you want to turn your life over to. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, as far as uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about OCD and GAD, if you got sure, you got another minute or so. Oh sure, absolutely. All right, cool. Yeah, you just let me know when you got to got to run. Um, yeah, so I'm curious, and and then we'll spend a little time talking uh, about uh, the book, A Liberated Mind, which I'm oh, very great. excited about. A Liberated so, Mind. Um, I'm curious. Like there are some you know, individuals who are more of the second wave CBT influence. And, you know, they will recognize that in OCD, like we're not gonna use any of our um, cognitive restructuring tools, you know, but when it comes to GAD related concerns, which are more, let's say more, um, you know, just constant regular everyday worries that just don't turn off, like they may then use more cognitive restructuring. Sure. I'm curious um, about your understanding about that distinction between GAD, um, you know, worry thoughts and OCD intrusive thoughts, um, kind of how ACT would potentially either see them the same or different and kind sure. of whether the approach would change based on, you know, that, you know, diagnosis. Well, it wouldn't be so much the diagnosis as it would be the person-specific details. Like, for example, there are times when dealing with worries just in a purely logical way makes perfect sense. Like if somebody truly is not informed about something. You know, if somebody really thinks, for example, if you get, uh, you know, anxious, you're going to have a heart attack and die. It's not going to hurt to say, well, you know, actually the data on that is it's really, 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 really rare for people to get anxious and then have a heart attack and die. And it does not very likely because of these physiological reasons. Uh, but, you know, very often if you ask the questions, people will tell you right back what you're about to tell them. In other words, they've done the reading, they've gone on the web, they've read the books, they know. Well, then why are you telling them? Because you're so smart. I mean, who nominated you? I mean, what do you do when you have worries that are hard to deal with. I mean, very often some of the same folks, I mean, you look at the actual data on, you know, are people more or less likely to have divorces and all that. You know, like the therapists are not so smart. Let's just be honest about it. So it's our secret. Um, it's our secret. <laughs> yes. In fact, in some areas, the data are a lot worse than they are with people right. who aren't therapists. So, uh, so if it really is a matter of information, for example, I'm cool with it. Uh, but I want to do it in a person-specific way and not simply by a s syndromal category. 
in part because there's so much overlap in these syndromal categories. There's so much variability within the same one that I think we're really getting awfully tired of it. I mean, even the NIMH doesn't want to fund it anymore. <laughs> yes, I, I saw a recent study where they took 3,000 people who had major depression and they listed all the signs and symptoms. And how many different patterns did they find in the 3,000 people? More than 1,000 patterns. So you go like, well, what is this ridiculous thing then? I mean, come on. You know, like can you do the math on PTSD? There's almost 700,000 different variants of P PTSD. They have these combinations of symptoms that are allowed, allowed by our diagnostic category. But so there's that. But rant over, coming back to when you would and when you wouldn't. I think the core of reappraisal is often not the new information that occurs or just the now you'll be convinced to only think about it this way because you're gonna think about it lots of ways back to the same reason that a lip gloss can produce a glass. What is really going on in our reappraisal methods when they work, and there's good data on this, is they work by cognitive flexibility. So sometimes by essentially saying, you know, in addition to thinking about it like that, you could think about it like this. Then you could think about it like that. And you could think about it like that. Now, which of those do you think would be like helpful to you in this situation? That's perfectly reasonable to me. I want to be able to think creatively, flexibly, broadly, you know, and there's good data on that in another way, you know, just being able to generate possible alternatives, boom, 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 in a fast way, predicts loss of positive outcomes. If you have enough uh, freedom to then pick the ones that are useful to you and leave the rest. You could turn that into a compulsion, by the way, but so don't do that. I'm not saying, but the flexibility of thinking is a healthy thing. So what diffusion does is it doesn't blow your mind. It isn't like you suddenly become irrational. It just softens the attachment to a particular formulation so that you can more openly have a variety of formulations. And then among those, what are the ones that right now seem to be most useful based on your history and your parsing of the situation and just based on your gut, not just your mindy filter, but also your sort of gut experiential filter. You know, like if you, I, this is a thing I often ask when I'm dealing with OCD, as I say something like, and is that a really new thought? Have you ever had a thought like that before? And I say, yeah. Well, how, did, how did it work in the past when you've done what you're saying you need to do now? Well, I felt better. Yeah, okay, immediately. And then what? And then it got worse. Okay, well, do you want to do something that, Will, quote, make you feel better and then make you worse. Yeah, that doesn't sound too, you know, so could we do something else? Could we do something that's really different? And if we're going to do something different, you know, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll get what you've been getting. Let's see if we could do something that's really more fundamentally different. And then a lot of the act stuff is more fundamentally different because they change the rules. It comes out of left field. It's on a completely different playing field. If you're singing your thoughts or you know, noticing what shape they have or what they you know, or, uh, you know, saying them slowly and so forth. There's a lot of playful things you can do with thoughts. So I'm fine with person specific choices about how to manage cognition. And my biggest focus would be cognitive flexibility and workability. You know, being able to think in a way that's flexible and free and to do what works. And that will help you whether it's your, you know, in a school system or working at work or managing your relationships with your spouse or that's going to be helpful to you. And some of the things that are called restructuring or reappraisal at times are really helpful, but they tend to be more the flexibility forms of it. In the studies on cognitive reappraisal, for example, when they are subtracted out of the flexibility effects they can have, most of what's left is not helpful, doesn't predict positive outcomes. Because you sometimes are really close to things that are, you know, what's the right thing? And I did I think about it the right way? Oh, no, I'm not thinking about the right way. 
you know, have you ever met somebody who's trying to do CBT really right and then gets obsessive about how wrongly they're doing CBT and then it's a whole nother variant of the same, you know, kind of entanglement? I've met a lot of people like that. So, because you can put perfectionism inside CBT. You can put rumination inside CBT. Uh, you know, not, it's not that CBT means to do that. It's just what humans sometimes do with cognitive change strategies. So why don't we put it as a cognitive flexibility strategy? It's safer. And then you can combine second wave and third wave in a, a way that's more uh, seamless. And, right. then, and then fit it to the different needs. And I think you're all right that in this broad category, there are some folks who are going to, you know, actually need and use they have a useful for for new information sometimes that's really helpful right yeah i think that was very helpful um speaking about workability i wanted to talk about uh about your new book um yeah. a, a liberated mind yeah and um i guess what i you know i'm halfway through so no spoilers okay but uh I will say it, it kind of made me fall in love with ACT all over again. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, you did really an exceptional job with it. Not that my compliments is going to no, uh, necessarily mean anything. But yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the concept of pivoting, yeah. right? Like, which wasn't, you know, you know, necessarily part of what many people have, you know, we learned about the hexaflex and the different things. I'm curious about, just the concept of pivoting and if you could speak about the book yeah. a little bit in general. It's a single thing that's most new about the book. If you know anything about ACT, you know what this book is, is an attempt to try to write a book that is a personal story, a science story and helpful. And it's a kind of a think book meets a self-help book. And so what I'm wanting it to be is a statement of the 40 year history of psychological flexibility, the research on it in a way that doesn't feel heavy and sciencey and finger waggy and geeky, but is personal and direct and useful and engaging. And, and you begin to see kind of like, you know, how we got in this situation, you know, that human beings come by suffering very easily because we're trying to do something that's really hard of taking symbolic thinking and sitting at a top, these processes that are a thousand times more ancient. And that's really hard because for one thing, give you an example that you're going to have feelings that this new part of human functioning says, oh, I don't like that. Well, dogs and cats don't have to do that. I mean, they have the feelings they have. They'll avoid situations that are harmful, but they're not going to struggle with their own feelings. They don't even know how to do that. They're not going to struggle with their own thoughts and memories. They don't know how to do that. We do. And so... Everywhere you go, your pain follows you, your history follows you, your memories follow you. If you've done something shameful or if something bad has happened to you that's really sad, if you've been abused, if you've been raped, if you've had tragedies happen, there's no place else for those things to go. You know, you're, there's no delete button in the nervous system. They're going to go th with you through your life. And how do you manage that? And so what I... What I discovered, I think maybe is the right way to say it, but what I came to realize in the work that I was doing in that more recently and what I put in a liberated mind, uh, this book took 11 years to write, but 40 years to produce what's inside it, is I began to see that there was a, a need or a yearning or a motivation that's inside human suffering. And, what, and it's exactly what's inside the flexibility processes. And what that told me was, you know, we're, it's not a problem that we're doing the things that are unhelpful or, or destructive. We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to meet a real need. The problem is, is this mindy recent part of us is not delivering the goods. It's luring us into the a kind of a fish trap where, you know, the way a fish trap works is it has a broad funnel on the outside, but then it narrows down and narrows down and narrows down and narrows down. By the time the fish realizes it's really in it, it can't turn around anymore. And it's happily, not we're unhappily, swims into the net. Well, it's like that. So let me give you an example. 
I mentioned this earlier, that we come into the world yearning to belong. Why? Because we're social primates. We're by far the most social and cooperative primate. And our development requires others for us to survive. And even when we become adults, if you're the cast out monkey, you're very likely the dead monkey. You know that. I mean, you have to be part of the tribe, part of the group. Well, that's certainly true when you're, when you're young and little, but it's still true even as you grow. So how do we get to belong? Well, I think this yearning for belong gets channeled in to justifying why you should be in the group, either because you're especially good or especially needy. You tell a story of who I am and what I bring to the group that you think will either lead you to come in because you're so sad, you're so disabled, you're so needy that surely any kind person would let you in, or because you're so special, you're so smart, you're so able, you're so loving, you're so trustworthy, you're so something positive that you'll be let in. But take one of these, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a good, kind person. Okay, are you kind all the time to everyone? Have you been kind your whole life? In all the situations, you big fat liar, you know that's not true. So you have to put on a clown suit, you have to pretend and you have to hope that people don't notice. Meanwhile, you're feeling half guilty that you're lying. B, if you fool people into, see, I'm so kind, I'm so sweet, and you're dampening down these places you can go where you're angry and you're unkind and you cut people off and you secretly think thoughts that are really critical of them and all that kind of stuff. By the way, some of the very things that sometimes hook people in OCD, right? I mean, what are we really afraid of? There's some monster within that will be revealed, right? Yeah, what if I'm a bad person? What if I'm a like, bad person? What if I'm evil? Yeah. What if I've got germs? I'm going to kill everybody, you know? They're not going to want me. I mean, it's, but it's right inside what? It's right inside a yearning to belong. And what we find, actually, the data on this, when you go inside the storied self, the ego self, the the conceptualized self, when you start, in a way, lying to others and then believing. I'll, I'll take the instance of lying. About one out of four of your interactions with people that are extended, you know, more than 10, 15 minutes long, include errors of omission or commission that you know about. In other words, there's little lies in there. If you do it, and if you look at why, it's not instrumental. It's not because you're going to get something from it. And yeah, people say, because otherwise I'd hurt their feelings if I told them that really, no, I don't like your blouse, I think it sucks, or whatever the thing is. Yeah, of course. But really what's in there is because otherwise I may not be included. I may be pushed out. Like if I were to say something offensive or if I'd just really say what's going on for me. But now here's the sad thing. So about one out of four, you create some sort of little white line. With those conversations, you now are significantly less interested in the person and less willing to engage in another conversation with them. You sense that there's something wrong. There's an inconsistency. And even what you're saying is so flowery and wonderful, you now are avoiding the person. So here you did this thing so that you could be included, so that you could belong. And the effect is, is that you have to stay away from people. Plus, if you did it knowing that, knowing that you did it, now you've kind of fooled them into loving you, caring about you, thinking well of you. Their opinions of you go down because who can believe the feelings of fools? You don't feel lifted up by the feelings of fools. So this is why narcissists aren't lifted up at all when people applaud and say they're wonderful. They just feel more empty. And so, and it happens on the negative side of telling the sad stories. But here's my point. What I realized in all of the inflexibility processes is that there's a deep underlying yearning. You could call it a need or a motivation if you wanted. And that it's what we're really trying to satisfy. So the reason we go into the conceptualized self, the reason we tell the stories is so that we belong and so that we'll be included. But it actually doesn't give us that. It gives us a sense of specialness and disconnection. We now are actually less, not more engaged with others. And so it, it's Lucy's football, you know, it's 
kick it and the, you know, it's going to go right through. Well, you're going to miss it again. But what do we do? We just tell the, we enter into the clown suit again, you know? So what act does in the flexibility processes is instead of giving you the smaller sooner reward that costs you the larger later reward, it puts you on a path where you get the larger later ones. How could you actually experience belonging, for example? Well, one way to do it is to slow down, to show up behind your eyes, and to come out and enter into the world of the eyes of the person you're interacting with, to take their perspective, to see how they're feeling, to be genuinely interested in what's going on inside their lives, to share what's going on inside yours. In other words, there's going to be this metaphorically kind of eye-to-eye connection. We even do this in ACT workshops, as, as you know, Elliot, right? We actually do this exercise. But in other words, belonging will be produced by conscious interconnection. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But to do that, you have to let go of the story. Right. You, you have to take more seriously the possibility that your awareness, consciousness, and presence, period, end of story, not the form, not the, the, the nice flowers on your lapel or the perfume you're wearing or the, whether or not you have wrinkles on your face or said the smart thing. No, just by being there. And, you know, you think about people who lifted you up. Think about the people who love and move you. And I bet you, you can find moments when you looked at them and you felt deeply seen and cared for. And that you could see their consciousness behind their eyes. They were there with you, connected with you. Yeah. And so instead of wearing a clown suit, could we take the time? And I think our mindfulness methods, our our spiritual traditions, I think ACT in its deepest sense, tries to strip self down to this place that's interconnected with the consciousness of others. And that's a real experience of belonging. And it, so instead, it's it's not going to give you the cheap thrill, two minute version of belonging. It gives you the longer arc of belonging, like being able to enter into a genuine conversation where you share what's going on with you and you're really genuinely interested in what's going on with the other person. It'll, It'll support that. So, I've given you one example of going from the yearning to belong, letting go of the attachment to the clown suit of the conceptualized self, good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't matter where it's form. Let all that fall away. Come into this more spiritual side of you, this sort of beyond categorization, pure awareness part of you, and now extend that out into interconnection with others. That really satisfies belonging. You feel as though you belong because you are in a relationship with others that is supportive and loving and caring and connected. That's true with each one of the pivots. And so it's, again, I held a fourth. I'm sorry for that, but um, I'd gone these rants, but I wanted to explain what's new. And in each of the areas now in Liberated Mind, I dig down to what did you really want? There's a simple way to say what I'm saying. I can cut through all the blah, blah, blah. Let's focus on what you really wanted and you're going to find inside your own misery, this precious jewel, this sweet strand of a human being yearning for something. That's not your enemy. Yeah, that way of doing it isn't going to work. Great. Let's learn from it. But now let's take the energy in that and redirect it in a brand new direction that will give you gradually, but then increasingly over time, what you really want. and there's six yearnings inside the six pivots. And I think there's pretty good evidence. I go through some of it in the book that these are yearnings that people deeply have and that they can deeply accomplish if they can get the mind out of the way, the problem solving mind out of the way and be able to bring the whole of us into satisfying those underlying yearnings. Yeah. Uh, that was so powerful. And I, I remember after reading that passage, I'm like, wow, I gotta stop lying. <laughs> just like ding, like, why did I have to like, you know, just give that detail that just was off. I, I think that was really cool. 
and uh, about that index, like I, I found the index really interesting because it was almost like a conversation. And it's like, if you need a, if you need a citation for that, like you should really just keep reading <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, so reading it was really, you know, excellent so far. And I'm really excited to continue. Uh, this conversation has been really awesome. I really appreciate your time uh, in the most honest way possible. And um, the link to the book is going to be on my website at myocbcare.com forward slash learn, as well as this conversation. And um, is there anything you'd like to add about the book or anything else before? Um, uh, I just say, if it, well, if people want to get on my newsletter list and all that, I don't spam people. Just go to stephenchays.com. There's a little seven lesson um uh, mini course on act that you can get on and yes. i you know i do let people know about the workshops i'm doing and i send out my blogs because i try to blog with some regularity and i put it out so those things happen and then uh yeah let's see let me know what you think of a liberated mind i i um have kind of written this in a way that i hope this is the act book that you can give to people without feeling as though you're either suggesting they need a shrink or should be one uh you know, we all need help and yeah. psychological flexibility is just useful to people. And I wrote mm -hmm. the book in hopes that people would be able to bring it into the cultural conversation and the family conversations that we have. And, you know, I do want to say this one little thing to the people who are listening, because my pre presumption is, Elliot, that a lot of folks are listening because they've struggled, they've suffered, they know something about pain. And that, man, this is, could sound reassuring or even patronizing, I, I hope you know, and if you read A Liberated Mind, you'll see, because I walk through my own panic disorder history and some of the details of my own family and the domestic violence in my home and things like that, you'll see uh, that I'm not saying this with a, any sense of uh, patronizing. But I think people who suffered are the lucky ones. If you can find that place in which it can, uh, move you towards being more fully human, whole and free. Because what you just stepped into is, is something that the person next to you knows something about. No, they may, maybe they don't have OCD, but you know, maybe they've got an addiction problem. Or maybe, you know, they're on, uh, you know, uh, uh, a journey that has uh, led to multiple failed relationships, or, you know, maybe they don't know how to face, uh, uh, the challenges of uh, a physical disease they have and on and on it goes. This is the human situation. And so what's in a liberated mind is kind of like a, a manual for why it's hard to be human and a guide for how to be more fully human. And when, when inside that you realize that your suffering's not your enemy, it's more like, uh, you know, the the uh, fates kneading dough, you know, softening you up, and um, I I hope that doesn't sound patronizing, but it it I do truly believe it. The people who are suffering in a way are the lucky ones because you have a chance. You've been given a chance to uh, change the system inside you, and then in the culture. And uh, you can't fail but turn on the television screen without realizing that it's needed. we got to figure out how to be uh, human beings and still live in the kind of modern world we're living in where that computer in your pocket can expose you to horror and judgment yeah. and comparison. And, uh, so uh, I kind of view people struggling with anxiety disorders as the lucky ones. And uh, yeah. y'all are fellow travelers if you're struggling with anxiety. Been there, still there, and uh, there's something really important inside an anxiety struggle that can yeah. lift up a human life. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, I hope to, you know, continue and I, I hope you'll all buy the book uh, Liberate in Mind and uh, have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elliot, and thanks to all those who 
we're listening or viewing on Facebook. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Take care.